Hey guys, how y'all doing? Hope you're well. Uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. For those in the back, you can hear me. All good. Cool, cool. Well, pleasure to be here and thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be talking all about how to master your supply chain. Anyone who's sourcing products from China or has an interest to source products from China, I want to show you how to do that in the best possible way. So without further ado, let's jump into it. This is going to be all about mastering your supply chain and how to qualify and build leverage with new suppliers. So just a quick intro on myself. Um, I've been living and working in China for the past 12 years. In that time, I've manufactured, sourced, and developed over 2,500 products, visited more than 500 factories, and attended more than 20 Canton fairs. That's led me to work with a lot of different brands, retailers, licenses, such as the NBA, the Olympics, the United Nations Ministry of Defense, as well as helping a lot of Amazon uh, private label sellers as well, and Shopify sellers as well. And I also have a YouTube channel called Sourcing with Kian, where I drop a lot of um, sourcing information and sourcing videos as well. So just to sort of give you a glimpse of the type of brands uh, that I've worked with, it, it's a wide variety from retailers, licenses, United Nations, Ministry of Defense, disaster relief. And a lot of people ask, like, well, how are you able to supply so many different companies? But it really just comes down to the common denominator of being able to source the absolute best price, at absolute best product, absolute best quality from the absolute best supplier, which is what I'm going to show you guys here today. Um, one of my favorite projects that I was involved with, um, as Ronnie mentioned, was uh, working with the Brazilian football player Neymar. Uh, which I developed a wide range of variety of products for him as well. Went to Brazil, met his whole team, which was really cool as well. And one of my fra favorite phrases before I get started is one called proximity is power. And that is to achieve the best results in your business, you have to put yourself in proximity of the people who will help you achieve that. So I went to China for the first time in 2010 and I loved it so much. First time I went to a factory, it really blew my mind. So I decided to move there and live there. Same when I started working with the NBA, I moved to LA. And I'm not just saying, hey, let's move around the world uh, for whenever we want to start a new business. But I think just being at this event today and putting yourself in proximity of the people which can help you get to where you want to get to is the best thing that you can do. So today what we're going to cover is how to find and qualify the best suppliers online, qualifying them, building a good relationship with them, understanding the sample process, and carrying out your pre-shipment uh, inspections. So just to get an idea, who in the room is sourcing products from China already? Who's doing it at the moment? Cool. And then who's actually been to China before to visit any of their factories? Just one. OK, cool. I mean, in, in the last two years, obviously, it's been very difficult for us to get out there. And I would always say to achieve the absolute best results with your factory, with your supplier, you want to be going out to China. But because we can't do that today, what I want to show you and cover is how we can do that from a few different websites. But the most popular one and most famous one um, is going to be Alibaba. Now, I want to show you my seven best practices, seven quick tips in order to get the absolute best results for finding new suppliers. Because a lot of people just go online, they type in the product that they're looking for, hit search, they go for the cheapest price. But they've actually got a really bad supplier, they have quality issues, the suppliers uh, don't deliver on time. So I want to show you my methods in order to get the absolute best suppliers. And I've actually got some screenshots here, which I don't know if you can see it, it's quite small. But the first hack, the first step, is searching by suppliers, not by products. Because when you go on Alibaba and you type in what you're looking for, it's going to sort it by the products and therefore sorting it by the price. But the purpose of Alibaba is not to find the best price, it's to find the best supplier. And once we find that best supplier, then we're going to negotiate the price down. So the first thing is on the tab, we want to search by suppliers. Then after that, we're, there's a two checkboxes, really important, we want to tick. Trade assurance and verified. Trade assurance, which means that our payments are protected. So if we ask for blue light blocking glasses and they don't work, Alibaba will refund us because we selected trade assurance. And then also verified. And verified is so, so important because these are the factories that have been verified by a third party. So if they say they have 300 workers in the factory, that's been verified. If they say they have 20 production lines, if they say they have 50 sewing machines, that's all been verified. So even though we can't go there, we know who we're working with just by selecting those verified suppliers. Then after that, we can also select the markets that those factories export to. So if I'm selling in the US, I want to select North America and Western Europe. And that's really important because then we're familiar with the quality standards that those factories are, are capable of supplying. So for example, if you're doing a pet product or a baby product and you're selling in the US, you want to work with the suppliers which have also sold in the US so you know that they understand the regulations and the certificates and they have everything FDA approved and all that sort of stuff. But if, if they've only been supplying, let's say, the Africa 
African market or their domestic Chinese market, they don't know the standards that we require in Europe and the US. So it's very important to select those markets that you also plan to sell to. And then you can also select quality certifications. I like to select ISO 9001, uh, which is a quality standard, ISO 14001, which is an environmental standard, and BSCI, which is your business social compliance initiative. And a factory which has those standards is going to be a top, top factory. They're working with top brands, so you can feel comfortable that you're in good hands when you're working with these guys. Then number five. I want to check how many years they've been selling on Alibaba because obviously during the pandemic, a lot of middlemen, a lot of people who are just operating out of an office jump into Alibaba, disguise themselves as a factory. They're not verified. They use another factory's information. They go on Amazon and grab other people's product images. They put it on their own one and they try to disguise themselves. But any factory, when you're looking at them by suppliers, you can see how many years they've been on the platform. So I typically like to work with suppliers which have been on there five years plus, not the ones which have just come online in the last two years. So I know they've got a proven track record and a proven history of supplying people on Alibaba. And then after that, once I've found that supplier, I want to click on products and see what are the core products that they do? What do they really specialize in? So if I'm looking for blue light blocking glasses, I want to see that they make um, goggles, reading glasses, kids' glasses. I just want to make sure that they specialize in glasses. But if I hover over products and I see uh, iPhone charger, fidget spinner, winter gloves, ski poles, I'm like, well, these guys aren't specializing. They're just middlemanning and they're finding other factories. So that's really important to check what are their core products as well. And then finally, I want to analyze their location uh, for, for, for two reasons. One, in China, they tend to uh, all group together in certain areas. So if I'm doing backpacks, I know I have to buy that from Xiamen or Chenzhou because that's the area where all the backpack manufacturers are grouped together. If I'm doing electronics, I know I have to be buying from Shenzhen because that's where the majority of those suppliers are. And then after that, I'm looking at their factory location. And when I look at their address, if I see unit 12 of an industrial zone, I know that they're in an actual factory. But if I see the 23rd floor in downtown Shanghai, then I know they're just working out of an office and they're a trading company. So I really want to know what is their location. Are they in the area which specializes in that product? And are they operating out of a factory or out of an office? So as I said, those screenshots were quite small. So I've just bullet pointed these things that I just went over. Searching by supplier, not by product. Selecting trade assurance and verified suppliers. Selecting the markets that are applicable to you. Selecting the highest quality standards. So you guys, uh, probably if you take a photo of that one, that's a nice little checklist for you guys to tick off as you're finding suppliers. But I've also got a YouTube video on this as well, on the Sourcing with Kian YouTube channel, in case you ever want like a walkthrough of that. But that's definitely a good sort of guide and the best practice to get started to align yourself with the best manufacturers. Now after this, something that I've found like working with suppliers for over 12 years is that the quality of your questions determine the quality of your results. And that goes for anything in life. But especially when working with suppliers, you have to ask them the right questions to get the best results. And a lot of people ask me for factory recommendations. They're like, hey, I'm looking for an electronics factory. I'm looking for a backpack factory. Can you find one? And I can give you the best factory in the world. But if you don't ask them the right questions, you're not going to get the best results from them. So what are those questions? What do we want to be asking those suppliers in order to get the best results? So I'm going to. I've got a lot that I could go through, maybe 20, but for the purpose of today, I'm just going to go over my seven top questions to be asking. The first one is, are you a trading company or a factory? And to be honest, I work with both. It's OK to work for a trading company. It's OK to work for a factory. But I want to know who I'm working with, because a factory is much more likely to give me credit terms. A factory is much more likely to be able to produce at much higher volumes for me, negotiate better prices for me. But a trading company, if I just want to order, if I want to do like pet products, but I don't want to deal with 10 different pet product suppliers, I just want to deal with one trading company, which has got relationships with all those different suppliers. I can go to one trading company and they can source all of those on my behalf. But I want to know who I'm working with. After that, I want to ask, how many workers do you have in your factory? And how many production lines do you have in your factory? And this is just very good to get an idea of what is the scale that that factory is capable of achieving. What is their production output? So for example, if I want to test the product, if I want to try something, I just want to order maybe 500 pieces, I don't want to give them a big order, I'm much more likely to get that from a smaller factory, a, a factory which has maybe only got you know, uh, 30 workers or 50 workers, because they're quite small, they also don't mind to do the small orders. But if I find a factory which has got 2,000 workers, 50 production lines, and I'm like, hey, I just want to order 400 pieces, they won't even entertain it. So I need to know who I'm working with, and then I know where I can allocate 
the orders that I want to be placing, if it's a trial or if it's a big order. And then as we kind of covered before, who, which are the three main markets do you supply? So I want to know, like, are, are the majority of your exports going to Brazil? Are they going to the US? Are they going to Germany? Are they going to Spain? Are they going to Japan? And then within those markets, I want to know who is your biggest customers. And I'm going to find those customers. I'm going to go on their websites. I'm going to read their reviews. And I'm going to buy those samples. And I'm going to be like, is this a brand that I align with? Is this a quality standards that I also like? Because I know that my factory is capable of manufacturing for these guys. So I want to know who those people are. And on top of that, I want to know, do you supply any big box retailers? So your Walmarts, your Tesco's, uh, your Bed Bath & Beyond, your Targets, and guys like that. And I want to know if they supply those guys because they have the highest quality standards as well. They go in, they do proper checks, they look at the, um, that they have fire extinguishers in the factory, they have adequate lighting, that the dormitories are okay. They have very, very high standards. And also, if they supply those guys, those guys also get the products down to the lowest possible price that they can be. So once I've built up a good relationship with those manufacturers, I'll say, hey, uh, what are you manufacturing for, for Target next quarter? Um, you know, if they're doing 100,000 units of something, well, I might develop a product which uses similar materials. So I can benefit from their economies of scale. Like, I'm not going to do the same product, but I'm going to use the same materials, and I'm going to order my materials. I'm going to place my order at the same time that they do. So I'm going to benefit from their economies of scale. And there's no way you can do that on the first order. You have to basically maybe place two or three orders, build up a little bit of leverage, build your relationship, get comfortable working with that manufacturer, and then you can really benefit from the economies of scale that they do for other customers once you know who they are. And then have you completed any factory audits? So I know that if you supply like Walmart, Walmart will go in and do their own audits. Disney will do their own audits. The Olympics do their own audits. And that's just good for me to know that if they've supplied those big companies, that, they're gonna be, that it's gonna be a good supplier for me as well. And then you can also get third-party companies like Intertech and SGS and guys like that. They'll go and do third-party audits as well. And then I always ask, can you send me a copy of those certificates? And I want to read that. And then when I get those certificates, I always check the company name and the company address on that certificate and make sure it matches with the address that they show on Alibaba so I know these are actually the same company and they've not just sent me a certificate from someone else. And then after that, I want to know, do you supply any brand selling on Amazon? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's okay if they do it, it's okay if they don't, but I just want to know about that. So for example, if I'm selling on Amazon and they also supply customers selling on Amazon, that's good because then I know that they know it's very damaging if we go out of stock, if we get late deliveries, we get penalized, um, we lose ranking, and they know how important reviews are. If we have a bad batch of quality, we'll have negative reviews, we'll drop ranking, we'll lose sales, and then as a result, they'll lose orders as well. So it's very important if they're familiar with that business model, and if they don't supply anyone on Amazon, that's also okay because I know they're not supplying my competition as well, but it's good for us to understand what they're capable of. And then finally, you know, as we looked on Alibaba, we looked at the core products. What are the core products? And on top of that, do you have any new products in development? Because we are constantly developing products, but at the same time, so are the factories. The factories are developing products for customers in Brazil, in Japan, in their domestic Chinese market. And if we're just supplying customers in the US, I might just say to my supplier, hey, I'm looking at developing new products for 2022, 2023. What have you been working on? Is there anything that we can order? And then they're happy because if they're developing a product and they're sharing it with you, they're getting orders for that new development from a customer that they already supply. So they're basically increasing their profitability with one customer by offering you new products. So that would be my top seven questions in order to get the best results. I'm not sure if you want to take a photo of that. And it's, you have to be careful of the right timing to ask these questions as well. You don't have to copy and paste that and send that in one email and then they just reply it one by one. There'll be a right time to ask these sort of questions. And then the factory will also respect you for asking these sort of questions as well. Because if you're asking about their production lines and who are the biggest customers and what inspections have you done, then they're like, well, this is a customer which really understands the buying process and they'll treat you with a little bit more care and a little bit more respect as well. So a lot of people also ask me as well, like, well, how, I can't go to China. How do I build a relationship with my manufacturer? And we have a lot of really good results by having quality relationships with our manufacturers. And I would say, build your relationship via WeChat. So I'm not sure if you use WeChat, but that's a Chinese app, same as Messenger, same as WhatsApp. And what I like to do is have informal conversations, chat to them there. And this is a screenshot of me like two days before uh, goods were going to go out for shipment, and I want to see, look, are the goods actually ready? But because I'd 
built that relationship via WeChat. I could just get on a FaceTime call with them. I would call them during their working hours and say, hey, the inspection's in a couple of days. Do you mind just taking the phone down to the factory production line? Do you mind just showing us the products? Do you mind just showing us that they're ready? And I can, I've got eyes and ears in the factory because I've got a relationship with, relationship with them via WeChat. So that's something I'd highly recommend. And then in terms of your communication with the factory, you want to keep all your important points to email, you know, your prices, your delivery dates, um, your formal conversations, the images of production, everything you've confirmed. But in terms of the WeChat conversations, you want that to be like your informal ones. Like, and this is a perfect time to do it because they just had Chinese New Year in China. So you can talk about, you know, how was your Chinese New Year? What type of food did you eat? Did you go back to your hometown? What did you get up to? Here's a photo of me and my friends. We went to the game this weekend. We're having some beers. When travel opens up, I hope we can all hang out together. And we're just building that relationship via WeChat so that we can then use that relationship to get the best results in our business as well. And here's just some images of me and uh, some suppliers. I highly, highly recommend. If you get the chance, you definitely go up to, uh, to China yourself because they very much respect the customers which come to their place of business. You're not going to China to a village town on a holiday. You're going there to do business. And if you go there to do business, they really respect you for that. And they'll give you the absolute best results. And the benefits of hang a, having a good relationship with your manufacturer is that they give you the best prices, right? because they want to see you succeed. The more units that you sell, if they give you a lower price, you sell more units, they get more orders. And I'll give you one example. I was um, one of my good friends I've worked with for over 12 years in China. He actually asked me to name his daughter, uh, give her the English name. He gave them the, her the Chinese name, asked me to name, uh, give her the English name. And a, su a supplier which has asked me to name his child is not going to screw me on the price. We have such a good relationship. We go on holiday together. I attend uh, my supplier's weddings in China. We have such a fantastic relationship. So as a result, they give me the best prices. We also get faster lead times. You know, we can call in favors. If you're going to go out of, uh, out of stock and you have to get your goods in for the 1st of May and you're going to be late, I'll call up the factory boss. We'll have a WeChat conversation. I'll say, hey, I need to call in a favor. I need you to put my items to the front of the production schedule. And I know like, from what we looked at before in terms of how many production lines that that factory has, we can see like, I know you've got 20 production lines. Can you just allocate two production lines for me and get my goods out before the end of the month? And because we have that relationship that can make that happen, we don't go out of stock, we don't lose ranking. As well as that, as we talked about before, they're gonna offer us new products as well. I'm gonna see all the products that they're working on. And then finally, we have instant communication as well. I can call or text someone right now and get an answer of what's happening in the factory. So that's, I would highly, highly recommend building the relationship. And if there's anything that you take away from this presentation today, if you, if you download the WeChat app and you start having that conversation with your supplier, watch this year the benefits that you'll get from that. Then the next thing I've sort of seen mistakes that sellers make is that a lot of them don't actually confirm a pre-production sample before going into production. And I get a lot of phone calls and a lot of people hit me up and they're like, look, I've got this issue with my stock. Um, it's not the right color, it's not the right fabric, it's not the right material, um, how do I fix it? And the first thing I say is, did you confirm a pre-production sample? They're like, no. So I was like, that is the absolute most important thing. There's three key samples that we need to have, right? When we have an idea for a product that we want to develop, the first sample I'm going to ask for is the counter sample, the development sample. This is my idea for the product. This is my changes. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to receive that first sample. And if I'm 100% happy with it, that's going to be my pre-production sample that I'm signing off. But if I need to make any changes, they're going to make those changes and then send it. But until I have a sample in my hand that I'm 100% happy with, I am now happy to give you my 30% deposit. I'm now happy for you to start production because you're going to mass produce the sample that I have in my hands. But without having that sample in your hands that you've tested yourself, you should be never giving away a 30% deposit because they go and produce what they think that you want, but it's not actually what you want. And you find out about it when you get all those negative reviews later on. But that's not the only thing. Once we have that pre-production sample, we also want to have the pre-shipment sample. The pre-production sample confirms the production. Then when the production is finished, I'm going to get a pre-shipment sample sent over. And I should have the pre-production sample and the pre-shipment sample side by side. And this is what I asked you to produce. And this is what you actually produced. And it should be 100% match. And if there's not, we need to fix it at source. Because in China, they'll be able to fix those for you right there and then. They're not going to charge you for it. But if you receive those goods in the US and for some reason there's a the wrong label or the wrong color or the wrong accessory on the product or something like that, well, now we have to pay to unpack all those boxes, remove all the packaging, add what we need to add, repack it, repalletize it. And those costs can be astronomical and not really a cost that the supplier wants to pay. So we have our development sample, our pre-production pre sample, and our pre-shipment sample. 
And once we've confirmed a pre-shipment sample, that's when we send in a third-party inspection company to then go uh, and verify that all the goods are actually there, that the production is actually what we confirmed, and we get a nice 60-page report. It costs about $200, and then that basically verifies um, everything that we wanted with that order. And one quick hack that I always like to do is that I always like to put my order number on the label of the goods that I'm producing. So if I'm producing this like denim shirt, right, on the label, I'm going to have my order number. Let's say it's purchase order 4050. I'm going to have that there. Because once you get to placing like 10 orders, what some suppliers do, well, the bad ones, um, they sometimes do a quality fade where in order three, order seven, order eight, they just gradually start reducing the material content. Like if you're doing footwear and the sole is 40% rubber, well, in order three, it might be 35% rubber, then 32% rubber, and it just starts deteriorating and they save money, save costs, and, but you don't notice that. But if you have your order number on the label, I'm gonna, and I keep all my samples from every production, from every order, either in my office or my warehouse, I'll just pull out all my samples from all my orders and they should all be exactly the same. But if I pull out a pair of shoes from order nine and a pair of shoes from order three, and these ones are a lot lighter than this one, I'm like, what's going on? And then we can solve it and we can fix it, we can get them tested and then we can uh, talk about it with the supplier. But if you never keep the samples and if you never track which sample came from which order, you don't really have any access to information of if there was a quality fade. So that's super important to put the, uh, the order number on the label. And then as I said, uh, I always like to carry out a pre-shipment inspection as well. We can't physically go there and a third party inspection company uh, can go on our behalf, like an Intertech or an SGS or someone like that. And why this is important, it's not that, hey, I don't trust you, I want to get my goods inspected, but it sets a precedent to the supplier that we check every single order. So for example, if you're doing this garment and uh, the goods are a little bit dusty or a little bit dirty, rather because they know we check every single order, they're gonna make sure they're clean and tidied and neat and folded and polished before they go in. But if we never did pre-shipment inspections, they'll be like, oh, it doesn't matter, they're never gonna notice anyway, they don't do any checks. And then the other thing is that sometimes mistakes happen. Sometimes it can be our fault, sometimes it can be the supplier fault. Sometimes I might give them the wrong label by accident, I might have told them the wrong quantity, I might have told them the wrong color, I might have had the wrong accessory on the product, I've got no idea. And I'll give you a quick example. It's doing military boots, right? And the black leather, uh, arrived at the factory and then they cut the leather to sew the boots but to where where to know where to cut they use a silver marker pen to know right these are the areas which I need to cut and then once the boot is sewn together they then remove that silver marker but for whatever reason whoever was in the factory that day was off sick who was supposed to do the cleaning and the, uh, and the polishing so then when the goods arrived or when the goods came to the inspection I noticed that there were silver markings on all the boots and I was like oh well all the customers are gonna reject this so we noticed that from the report the factory took out all the boots, they repolished them, they reorganized them, they repacked them, and then they shipped it out, and there was no issues whatsoever when the goods arrived. But those, those were two 40-foot high cube containers. I would have been absolutely screwed if they arrived and I hadn't done that pre-shipment inspection report. And typically an inspection is about $200. The value of your order could be $10,000, $20,000, $100,000. So for the value of the order and the cost of an inspection, it's so, so important to carry that out. And even if you've been working for a supplier for so many years, it's very, very important, even if you have the, all the absolute trust in the world. But then for any, uh, show of hands, has anyone done a pre-shipment inspection report? No one? Okay, cool. So I I if it's something that, I, well, I highly recommend you do it, but if it's something that you do do, the most important thing to understand a pre-shipment inspection report is the AQL level. That's the accepted quality level. And there's three types of faults you can get in an inspection. Your minor, major, and critical faults. So let's say, for example, we're doing like a, lit a little kid's scooter. A minor fault would be scratch and dust mark. A major fault would be that the handlebars are like two, cent two centimeters shorter than they should be. The product still works, but it's a bit of a major fault. And the critical fault would be that the wheels don't turn, the product doesn't work. And then for every inspection, they allow 0% for critical, 2.5% for major, and 4% for minor, and as long as your inspection, there's faults that lie below that, then your inspection is passed. So that's the best way to read a, read a report to judge if you want to pass or fail a particular inspection. So that's basically it. Thank you very much for, for uh, hanging out with me today. If you want to learn more, I do have a Facebook group and a YouTube channel just called Sourcing with Kian. Um, a website as well, titansourcing.com if anyone needs any supply chain help, if anyone needs to source products. Uh, we do have about four minutes, so if we can open up to Q&A if anyone's got any questions uh, about their supply chain, about products, feel free to shout out. Do we have a microphone?
test. Thanks, man, for uh, amazing presentation. I've yeah. watched some of your videos previously. Oh, cool. Uh, my question is, how do I know the location for, I'm starting an apparel brand, uh, clothing for men. Mm. How do I know the best location when I'm so looking for the supplier? That, that's a great question. And like quite often, we don't actually know what are the areas which specializes in that product. But in terms of the steps that we put, in terms of like verified factory, number of years we've been in business, the quality certificates that they have, that filters out the top suppliers. And then as you're scrolling through those suppliers, the first word in every company name is either the city or the province that that factory is from. So I want to see consistency, right? So let's say, for example, it might be like Jinjiang province, right, which is most popular for clothing. If I see Jinjiang pop up five times out of eight, I know that's the common area because I've already found the top suppliers, and this is the name which is coming up most often. But then, essentially, if I see like Shenzhen, like one out of 10, I can just disqualify them because I know they're not in the area which specializes. And sometimes there might be multiple areas which specialize in it. But once I've found that area, I'm going to click on those suppliers and I'm going to click on what are their core products and make sure all their core products are clothing and they're all from that area as well. Cool. Hi. Uh, I was wondering in your services or any advice for a print on demand supplier for US or Europe? As, so for print on demand, it, it, it's difficult, right? Because the presentation I kind of covered was more for like mass production, but like print on demand, a completely different business model. But that is more popular now for like your domestic markets because the import duty rates are so high from China, the shipping costs are so high. So a lot of people are now looking at other countries as well. So sometimes even if the cost of goods is um, more expensive doing it domestically, it might be more cost effective for you overall in terms of being able to do it locally. But w w was that your question in terms of if you can still do print on demand? From uh, if any suggestion through your company or right yeah. here that you could give me to, to help out because the margins are really, really short. Yeah, I, I mean like my, my issue with print on demand is that you don't have a consistency of quality because they're just making it every time you order it. So if you can talk to a manufacturer, if you can go through that process and find a manufacturer and say, look, my business model is print on demand. Do you hold any raw materials in stock? Do you hold fabrics in stock? Because if you're doing a basic black cotton t-shirt, I want to say like, right, can you just allocate a thousand yards of fabric and over the course of the next three months, or the next six months, I'm gonna take that, but that's gonna be my fabric. And if after six months I don't take it, then I'll, 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 I'll place an order for that fabric or you can sell it to someone else or whatever it may be. But that way I know I've got consistency and I've also got shorter lead times as well because they're not going out and ordering the fabric when I place the order, it's right there. So they can literally just access the fabric, cut and sew, and then it, it can go out. Thank you. Cool, cool. Hello. Uh, what do you think about uh, a European suppliers like Turkish, Polish? Yeah, so uh, suppliers outside of China. Yeah, very, very important. And I think more than ever in the last year, a lot of people have, uh, a lot of people have been looking for suppliers outside of China. And that's okay. I think it's a very good exercise to look at suppliers that you can find outside. But the most important thing is finding a supplier in a country which specializes in the raw material of the product that you're trying to produce, right? So for example, India are very strong in cotton, canvas, wood, handcraft, right? So if I'm, gonna, if I'm in those categories of products, I know I need to go to India, right? And then like say, Turkey are very good for fabrics as well. So if I've got a clothing brand, I know I can go to Turkey. But then essentially how to find those, because if you have an electronic product and you're like, oh, I'm gonna source it outside of China, let me go to India, and they don't specialize in it, that's gonna uh, cause a variety of problems. So what I would say is, um, when you go on Alibaba, right, you, Alibaba have actually invited a lot of um, factories from other parts of the world onto their platform. So if you type in whatever product that you're looking for and then just hit search, if you scroll down on the left side of the page, it brings up the number of results per country. So if I see, like, if I'm looking for, like, I don't know, plastic food containers and I see Thailand has 450 results, I'm like, great, I should be going to Thailand and I'll just click that and I'll only talk to those suppliers. The other thing I like to do as well is find a product in the retail store look at the label, look at the country that it was made in, and then target those countries as well. But it's so important to look at the countries which specialize in that product, and then you're good. Okay, thank you. Cool, cool. We're actually, we're good? Cool, cool. All right, thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you soon.